Okay, so hello everyone, aliens and normal human beings. What is the best place to find life in the solar system? Of course, there is life on Earth, um, but where else in the solar system could we find life? Where else would you look for life besides Earth? What would be the best place to find life? And the answer might surprise you, because the best place to find life might not be on any of the planets, but it might be on one of the moons of one of the planets, on the moon of the giant planet Jupiter. And that moon is called Europa. And this is Europa in front of Jupiter. And compared to Jupiter, it looks like a very small moon, but in fact, it's about the same size as our own moon, so not small at all. Now, what's so special about this moon Europa? This is what it looks like from close by, and it has a surface that's made of water ice. What's really interesting is that under that ice, there's an ocean of liquid water. So you have ice on the outside, and underneath the ice, there is an ocean that completely um, engulfs the, the, the whole moon. So there's an ocean that stretches all over the moon. And that ocean, could be really deep. It could be a hundred kilometer deep. And with such a deep ocean, there might actually be more water in Europa, in the ocean of Europa under the ice, than there's liquid water on the surface of the earth. And the two blue balls here, they show the volume of water on each object. And you can see that the volume of the liquid water on the earth is a bit smaller than that on earth, than that on Europa. And that's because the oceans on, on Earth are not that deep at all, just at most 10 kilometers, while the ocean of Europa could be 100 kilometers deep. And that there is so much liquid water is very interesting in the search for life, because liquid water is one of the things we know are necessary for life, at least life as we know it on Earth. So with that, there is a chance life could exist inside Europa. And even more interesting, as you can see on this slide, um, there's ideas, there's uh, some evidence that suggests that water from inside Europa's ocean is actually able to um, get through the ice and escape into space where it forms explosions of water, like water volcanoes or water plumes, as we call them, that are more than 100 kilometer high. So water that's venting out through maybe cracks in the ice into space into very large eruptions. And if we could fly with a spacecraft to that water that's leaking out of Europa, then we could take samples of, of the ocean water and search for any kind of trace of life. And there are two space missions that actually uh, are, have the right instrumentation to do that. And they're currently being built and they're gonna be launched in the next two years. There's an American mission called Europa Clipper and the European Space Agency is building the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer JUICE. And with that short introduction, that brings me to the main three things I want to tell you about today. I want to answer three questions. Why could there be life on Europa? Why do we think that there is life in Europa? Um, how do we know that there's water in Europa? And how could we search for that life? Those are the three guiding questions of this talk. Before I go into detail, I'll introduce myself as well a few things about my background and i also want to say if you have questions during the presentation i'll stop a few times in the talk and give you a chance to ask any questions and also be around at the end of the talk to answer more questions just briefly about myself so my name is hans i'm originally from belgium um, i grew up being passionate about space from when i was a kid i saw the comet hill bob from the backyard of my parents uh, house and seeing that comet fly by Earth is one of the things that really inspired me as a, as, a, as, an, uh, as a six year old. And that set me on a path to become a space scientist. You also see a picture below of me in the astronomy club that I joined when I was a teenager. And that's uh, where I further developed this interest for space. And as an adult, I became a space engineer and a space scientist. I've worked in different places in Europe, uh, such as the European Space Agency, and I'm now I'm doing research from the Middle East. And of course, my favorite object that I like to study is Jupiter's moon, Europa. And I'll be telling you later as well what I'm doing specifically in this whole story, in the search for life on Europa. And that brings me to that first question. 
Why do we think there could be life on Europa? And to answer that question, we need to ask ourselves the question first, what is needed for life in the first place? And I want to uh, turn that question to you. So I'm going to use the Wook Lab now, and I'm going to ask and see what you think is required for life. So if you go to the Wook Lab, you, see, you should see a new question now, that is, what is required for life? And I'd like to ask from you, what do you think is needed to develop life anywhere in space? And I'm lo really looking for the, like the most basic things. And just to remind those people that uh, didn't manage to join the Wook Lab previously, if you um, go to the Wook Lab link in the chat, you can join with the code on the website where you can uh, tell me what you think about what's required for life. And I see that a bunch of people are um, throwing in suggestions. Uh, one that comes back is water. Of, yes, water is definitely a thing that's needed for life, at least life as we know it on Earth. All life on Earth seems to require some water. So I completely agree with that one. Um, There is somebody that mentions that there might be other solvents, like re replacements for water. That could be true, but so far we have not found any evidence of any life that doesn't use water. So um, who knows? Some other things that people mention are organic compounds, oxygen, um, amino acids, O2. And I, I would agree with all of those, um, but I'm going to make it very simple and call those the basic chemical building blocks of life. They are definitely needed. And um, I think I summarized like the, the main answers that I got from you. And uh, there's still one or two things missing perhaps that I haven't seen yet, but that are quite crucial in, in um, for life. So, Thank you for your input. I'm going to go to the slide and get to what I um, was looking for. So what's needed for life? Well, many of you said liquid water. That is indeed needed for life, as you know, it on Earth. Many of you are talking about amino acids, oxygen, O2, carbon. Um, I summarize that as the basic chemical building blocks for life. And the most basic elements that we know that are important for all life that we know are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and sulfur, and phosphorus. Those seem to be the most basic chemical building blocks that are present in all kinds of life and that are also used to build amino acids that somebody mentioned. One thing Sorry, the microphone is not working properly for the last two seconds. Hello, test, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now it works. Okay, so the, the last thing I was saying is that we also need time. L life needs some time to develop. You need liquid water and chemical building blocks for a long enough time to develop. And besides these three think things, you also need a source of energy. And that one is perhaps the least obvious one in the case of Europa. Because liquid water, we know it's there. And I'll tell you in a lot of detail later why we know it's there. The chemical building blocks, we have either observed them or we have very good reasons to believe that these are present in Europa. And time, as far as we know, that ocean of Europa has existed for billions of years. And that should be enough time for life to get a chance to develop. At least it was on Earth. But energy, how does that work on Europa? And for that, I have a next question for you. So this is a painting of it's an artist impression of an artist that tried to imagine what life in the ocean of Europa could look like. And there are some obvious things that are wrong about this painting, I would say, and some things are correct. And specifically for you, I would like to ask if you can identify something that's definitely wrong about this picture and that's crucial in the question about energy for life in the ocean of Europa. So I'm going to go back to the Wook Lab the next question and i'd like to hear from you what you think is incorrect about this painting and i'm looking for something that um 
that tells us something about energy in the ocean of Europe, sort of energy for life. I see a bunch of suggestions coming in, and I think a lot of you um, are thinking in the right direction. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the answers that I maybe don't agree with. Um, somebody says the human. It's not necessarily impossible that humans can swim in the ocean of Europa. Even though the ocean of Europa is so deep, um, the pressure in the ocean is less than in the ocean of the Earth because Europa is smaller and has less gravity. So if you could bring a human to Europa, drill through the ice and put the human in a protective suit, then you could swim in the ocean of Europa, even at the bottom of the ocean. It's not impossible. And another thing that's not necessarily impossible, perhaps a bit too optimistic, is the fish. And we don't know if life exists in, in the ocean of Europa, um, but if it, if it exists, it might just be simple bacteria. But so far, we cannot tell. And it's not excluded that more complex organisms exist in the ocean of Europa. So I'm not going to say that the fish is necessarily wrong. Perhaps it's too optimistic. Um, maybe we should be happy with just the bacteria. Um, but I'm not going to say that's the thing that's completely wrong. But let me get to what's definitely wrong. And I think many of you guessed it. Um, it's the, the light. As I told you in the beginning, Europa's ocean has a thick layer of ice on top. And that layer of ice is, as far as we know, at least a few kilometers thick. So inside the ocean of Europa, it's going to be completely dark. And that could be a problem for life, because at least on Earth, light from the sun is the main source of energy. Um, we humans might not need light directly that much, but we eat plants that uh, need sunlight in their uh, process, that, that needs sun, sunlight as a source of energy. And we eat animals that eat those plants. So indirectly, humans also need sunlight to be able to live. And sunlight really is the driver, the, the main source of energy for all life on Earth. And since it's going to be very dark in the ocean of Europa, sunlight will not be the driver, will not be a, an energy source for life in that ocean. What then could be uh, the source of energy for life in Europa's ocean? And that has to do with something else that we see in this painting. Those are those hydrothermal vents that you see, those, those streams of bubbling um, oxygen, uh, the, those, sorry, the, the bubbles that you see coming from, from this uh, ocean floor. And that has something to do with something we know from Earth. On Earth, there are so-called black smokers on the bottom of the ocean. And these black smokers, they have been discovered by the submarine on the left, the same submarine that discovered the Titanic. And during one of its dives, that submarine on the bottom of the ocean discovered vents or mineral rich hot water is bubbling up from the bottom of the ocean. You can see an example of that on the picture of the right, on the right. So it's almost boiling or boiling water that's very mineral rich and therefore uh, very dark. So it's like, dark smoke coming from the bottom of the ocean, even though it's hot water. And what's very remarkable about these black smokers is that it was scheming with life around them. Even though normally the um, bottom of the ocean is rather barren, around these black smokers, there's a lot of life. And what seems to be the case, uh, an ecosystem has developed that derives its energy from these black smokers. Certain bacteria have evolved to um, use the substances in these black smokers to produce energy. And these bacteria then in turn are eaten by, for example, the worms that you see um, around the black smokers. So there, an ecosystem has developed that gets its energy not from the sun, but from these black smokers. And we have good reasons to believe that Europa's interior might also be hot and that therefore there could be these black smokers on the bottom of the ocean of Europa. And why do we think that Europa could be hot on the inside? Because that's quite a crucial element of this story that I would like to explain. And it has to do with um, the gravity of Jupiter and the peculiar orbit of Europa around Jupiter. 
So Europa's going around Jupiter all the time, but not in a perfect circle. Instead, it goes around Jupiter in an ellipse. And the strong gravity of Jupiter is pulling on Europa. If this uh, beach ball that you see on the camera um, is Europa, then the strong gravity of Jupiter is sort of pulling on Europa, kind of stretching Europa. And when Europa is closer to Jupiter, it feels more stretching because of Jupiter. And when Europa is further away from Jupiter, it feels less stretching. So every time Europa goes around Jupiter, its shape changes from more like a sphere, less stretched, to more stretched, almost like a rugby ball. So every time that Europa goes around Europe, Jupiter, its shape changes. And it's kind of like Jupiter is kneading Europa. That kneading causes friction inside Europa's interior. And that friction causes heat. And it's that heat that keeps Europa warm on the inside and keeps Europa's ocean liquid in the first place. And so because Europa is likely to be warm on the inside, it's not unthinkable that there are these hot vents on the bottom of Europa's ocean, geothermal vents that could supply energy to life forms in the ocean. So to recap, why do we think there is life in the ocean of Europa? Because we think there's water, because we think the chemical building blocks are there, because we think there could be a source of energy in the form of these geothermal vents, and because we think Europa's ocean has existed for billions of years. And if you put all that together, then that brings us to why we think there could be life in the ocean of Europa. And with that, I'm just going to take a, a pause and see if you have any questions for me. So you can write any questions um, in the chat. I see that a few people already did that. So I'm just going to... Um, uh, see uh, if there's any questions from, from you. And I see that a few are already asked. So um, let me start with the most recent one. How old is Europa? That's an interesting question. Um, so we think that um, uh, the, the moons of Jupiter were likely formed together with Jupiter. So about 4.5 billion years ago. The, the whole solar system was formed out of a cloud of gas and all the planets and the moons formed around the same time, like more than four or four and a half billion years ago. And we think that, um, and we have various scientific reasons to believe that uh, the moons indeed formed together with Jupiter. Uh, somebody's asking me, uh, the jets on Europa, those, the ones that I mentioned at the beginning, are they caused by the same friction from stretching? Um, the answer is we don't know, but that's a very likely explanation. If you imagine um, the stretching motion, uh, if you stretch ice continuously, that ice is gonna crack up. And that's likely what causes those red stripes on Europa's surface as well. Those red stripes, they're um, probably cracks in the ice through which some water has leaked out. Now water has some salt in it, and that salt under the radiation from space turns red over time. And that's why these, many of these cracks are, are reddish. That red is salts or other material from inside the ocean that has turned red over time under the influence from radiation from space. Let's see. Um, is it cold on Europa? Yes. Uh, the surface of Europa is um, more than a... 100 degrees below Celsius. The inside Europa, because of that kneading, because of that heat production, it's going to be much warmer. The, the ocean is liquid, so the temperature of the ocean should be at least around the melting temp point of water. If we think that the requirements for life are met in Europa's ocean, why haven't we found life in the ocean? That's because nobody has ever been in the ocean of Europa. Um, I'll tell you later what we know about Europa, Europa and its ocean, and it's not that much yet. And um, we really need to go there with the right spacecraft, with the right instruments to, uh, to find, to look for that life in a dedicated way that hasn't been possible yet. Let me just see if there's one or two more questions that I can answer. Um, how long would it take to get to Europa? Yeah, that 
that would depend on what kind of rocket you have. The more powerful of a rocket you have, um, the faster you can get there. For example, um, uh, the, the European mission that I mentioned in the beginning, JUICE, that will be launched next year with Europe's most powerful rocket, rockets, the Ariane uh, 5. With that rocket, it would take about seven years to get to Jupiter. But the Americans have the space launch system. That's a new gigantic rec rocket that will carry astronauts back, um, back to the moon. And if the Americans would use that rocket, and they could get to Europa in two or three years just because it's so powerful. So you're never going to get fast to Europa, but you could do it in two or three years if you have a really powerful rocket. So light is not strictly... So somebody is asking me a different question. Is life necessary? Is light necessary for life? And uh, we think no. Um, if you have another source of energy, then light is not needed. Life can exist um, without light. For example, at the bottom of the Earth's ocean around these geothermal vents, um, life exists that doesn't need any sunlight. It's very dark there. And instead, they get their energy from the chemical compounds in these um, hot water vents in the bottom of the ocean. I hope that's clear. Um, if you have more questions, you can ask them later. I'll stop uh, another few times for questions and also at the end, um, I'm happy to discuss things in more detail in case something is not clear yet. So that brings me to the next main question. How do we know that there's water in the ocean of Europa? And that's a complicated question. And most what we know about the ocean comes from one spacecraft, the Galileo spacecraft. It's the only spacecraft that has been um, close to Europa, the only one to visit it from close by. And this spacecraft studied Europa in different ways. It made different kinds of measurements. And it's from the combination of those different measurements that we have been able to build a very convincing case that Europa should have an ocean. I'm not going to talk about all the pieces of evidence that uh, that spacecraft collected, but I want to talk to you about some of the most uh, the most understandable ones. Um, I'm going to start with um, taking a look at the pictures that that spacecraft took. The pictures it took from different moons of Jupiter, and if we look at closely at these pictures, we get a few good hints that something is unusual with Europa, and that in fact it might have an ocean of liquid water under its icy surface. On this picture on the left, you see Europa, and on the right, Callisto, which is another large moon of Jupiter. And if you uh, compare these picture, pictures, that's the same thing the scientists did back in the time when that spacecraft was there. If you compare these pictures, then you'll notice some differences. And I'm going to go to the Wook lab again for the next question, because I'd like to ask you, what kind of differences do you see between these two moons? And there are many, but some of them tell us uh, about Europa's ocean, or at least the possibility of an ocean. So I'd like to hear from you what you think are the differences. One person already got the answer, but I'm going to give the rest a chance as well. I see uh, some interesting suggestions uh, coming in. And I think many of them are going in the same direction. Somebody is talking about the specks of light and uh, the points on Callisto. So I think a bunch of people have answered, and I think you're all thinking in the right direction, even though you might be using different words to describe the same thing. Um, I think everybody of you is looking at uh, the spots, and that's indeed what, what, uh, what's so remarkable if you compare the two. Um, Callisto on the right side has a lot of these bright spots, and Europa doesn't seem to have any of those, or almost none. What are these bright spots? Those are craters. Those are 
holes in the surface of Callisto that were made by rocks or pieces of rubble that came from space and hit the surface of Europa, uh, uh, of Callisto. But that's a bit peculiar. Um, I have one more question for you. Uh, if, you com if you compare the two, what would you expect? Would you think that Europa has about the same number of craters as Callisto? Um, should it have less craters per, per square meter than Callisto? Or should it have more um, cra craters per square meter than Callisto? And think about it like this. They're both moons of Jupiter. They're going around Jupiter. And they're sort of in the same space, the same area in space. W what do you think? Which one should have the most craters? I see a couple of answers coming in, and, and the, the answers are going a bit in all directions. There are some people for every question. Some people think um, more Callisto, many. Uh, some people think Europa and Callisto should have about the name, same number of craters. And there are a bunch of people that think that Europa should have less uh, craters per square meter. I'm just going to give it a little longer because I see that not everybody has had a chance to think about it. So the answers are quite distributed, but most people expect actually that Callisto has about the same number of craters than Europa. And that's actually not what we scientists uh, are thinking. We think that Europa and Callisto are in the same area and space. They're going around Jupiter, and they're about the same age. As far as we know, they were formed together with Jupiter. So they're both about 4.5 billion years old. And that means that throughout their life, about the same numbers of, of uh, meteorites from space should have hit either of these objects. So we would expect that for the same surface, Europa and Callisto should have about the same number of craters. And it is then very remarkable that Callisto does have a lot of craters because it's old, but Europa, even though it has the same age, has virtually no craters. That is very remarkable. And that brings us to one thing that I want to teach you, a very important trick that all space scientists know. Um, if you look at the surface of any object in space in our solar system, and you notice that it has few craters, then that tells you that the surface of that object is very young. Because if it were old, it should have a lot of craters. So few craters means young surface. Many craters means old surface. Every time scientists go to a new moon or a new planet and we look at the surface, the first thing we look at are these um, craters. And if we see that there are very few craters, that means the surface of that object is young. And usually that's remarkable. And that tells us that something special geologically is going on on that object. And in the case of Europa, the lack of craters points us to the existence of an ocean. And I'm going to explain that in the next question. I want you to compare these two pictures of moons of Jupiter. And I want you to tell me in the book lab which one of those two you think is the oldest. Which of these two surfaces is older than the other one? Let me go to the question. So um, tell me if you think A is the older one, B is the older one, or can you tell me? if they, you think they have the same age. So I see a bunch of answers coming in. Um, it's about evenly split between um, a is the oldest and they have the same age. Nobody thinks that surface B is the oldest surface. I'll just give it a little longer to see if some other people want to chip in their opinion. I'm assuming everyone that wanted to give in their opinion has, has done so. So actually most people, 60% go for A, and about 40% say that they're the same age. And um, I would also say that A is the oldest one. That surface is full of craters, and B has, all, has no craters at first sight, 
Um, the fact that, and, and, and I should also tell you that A on the left is Callisto again, that same moon that we've been looking at. Now we're zoomed in and you can see that everything is made of craters on Callisto. Inside of every crater, you'll find another crater. And if you look well in that crater, you'll find another crater. So everything is craters. So this surface is very old because it's been, bar been bombarded so many times. But the surface in B doesn't have any craters and it's relatively smooth. So that tells us that that surface is very young. And that is a piece of the surface of Europa. But it's a bit of a trick question because there's actually a crater in the picture B. If you look very well near the middle, there's like um, a bunch of circles, sort of concentric circles with, with a, uh, like a circle in the middle, like a, a patch. And that is actually a crater or what's left of a crater. What happened here? Or what do scientists think that happened and what does it have to do with an ocean? Because that's what we were after. It might be something like this. If you imagine um, a little lake on the earth or a frozen river, and if you make a hole in the ice by throwing a rock in it, then that rock might make a hole in your ice and some water from underneath will come up. But if you come back the next day, your hole will be gone because the water froze again. And something similar might be happening on Europa. If a big rock comes from space, it hits the, uh, the ice, makes a hole in the ice, and then that hole will be filled up again by water from underneath and it freezes again. And so the crater disappears. So the fact that we don't see many craters on Europa might be because Europa's ocean is erasing all the craters that are formed. So the fact that there are no craters and that we see some of these craters that have frozen up again, that tells us that under that surface of Europa, that young surface of Europa, that there might be an ocean underneath. Um, just before we go on, I want to test you again. And there are three surfaces this time, and I want you to sort them from old to young. Uh, just which one do you think here, here is the oldest? So do you think um, A is the oldest, and then B and then C? Or do you think B is the oldest, and then A and then C? Or do you think it's C, A, and B? So remember the trick about the craters that tells you about the age of the surfaces. And I see a lot of answers are coming in. Um, not everyone has replied yet, so I encourage you to think about it a bit longer. Take a close, close, close look at these three surfaces from three different moons and tell me which one you think um, have the youngest, sorry, the oldest surfaces. So oldest first and then the youngest. So uh, the answers are very divided. There's a few people for every answer, um, but uh, what I would have said is B, A, C. I think B is the oldest surface because it's full of craters everywhere. Um, I think C is the youngest because it's rather smooth, but no craters. And A seems to be somewhat in between, like it has, surface that looks like A, uh, like C, with not a lot of craters, but maybe with some cracks. Um, but it also has areas where there's more craters. And these are three different moons of, of, um, of Jupiter. The, the one in the middle with the most craters, that was Callisto again. The one with the least craters was Europa again. And the other one that was sort of in between is Ganymede. It's the biggest moon of Jupiter. And Ganymede is a little bit in between. It has surfaces like Callisto with a lot of craters, surfaces that are very old, but it also has some kind of younger surfaces that are more like the surfaces on Europa. And that tells us that, well, maybe Ganymede might also have an ocean. We're just less sure about Ganymede than we are about Europa. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. One last question about surfaces. This one's isn't important because I'm going to come back to this one later in the presentation. If you compare these two surfaces, which one do you think is the oldest? Is that A or B? This is the last one about age, but it's a crucial one. And it's maybe not what, you, what I've led you to believe so far. <laughs> 
Okay, there are many questions coming in, and I think most people are uh, thinking the same as what I uh, was thinking when I prepared this. Uh, just a little longer because some people seem to be still thinking about the answer. Yeah, I think like two thirds of the people say that B is the oldest, the one on the right, and the other people seem to think that A is the old, oldest. This is a little bit of a trick question. The one on the right, B, is Europa again. And so far, in every example that I gave you, Europa was always the youngest one. But now it's the oldest one. And that's because on the left, we have a surface of another moon of Jupiter, a moon that's called Io. And there's something special with this moon. This moon, that's what it looks like. It is covered with volcanoes. All these spots that you see on the surface of your Io, these are volcanoes. These are, there are hundreds of volcanoes on Io that are active all the time. This is a thermal image of Io. It's, it's not visible light, but it's heat coming from the surface. And you can see that there are bright spots everywhere on the surface of Io. These are volcanoes. They're active all the time. So every crater that's formed on the surface of Io is erased again because there are volcanoes that uh, that um, that uh, expel lava and that lava fills up any new hole that's from on the surface of Io. And that's why that surface of Io is so smooth because it's just constantly being renewed by the volcanoes. We did see like a few dark patches and those dark patches were in fact volcanic craters from which the lava is coming. So Io, very young surface because of the volcanoes. Now to wrap up this part about the ocean. So I told you that there was a spacecraft, only one that's ever visited Europa from close by. And it took pictures of the surfaces of the moons. And in these pictures, we see hints that Europa might have an ocean. But it doesn't tell us for sure that there is an ocean. Because I showed you that crater that has been erased by maybe water from underneath. But it doesn't necessarily have to be water. It could also be that under the surface of Europa, there's slushy. You know those uh, drinks that you can get at the beach? Like it's made of ice, but you can, you can slurp it. You can drink it. The ice is movable. So maybe instead of water, there's like frozen, uh, like some kind of frozen but movable stuff underneath um, the surface. That can also explain why the craters disappear. But this is not the only evidence we have. The Galileo spacecraft also investigated the gravity field of Europa and the magnetic field around Europa. And I'm going to talk about those in detail, so you can ask me about them later. But if you look at the evidence that's coming from the gravity field and the magnetic field that tell us about the inside of Europa, then you know that that layer that's raising the craters cannot be slushy. It has to be liquid water with some salt in it. So it's by combining all these different pieces of evidence that scientists have established that there's liquid water under the surface of Europa. So it's a complicated puzzle. Um, this is the last part, how it could we find life. I'm just going to take a short stop and see if there's any more questions about what I've said so far. I see that a few um, came in. Um, Yes, some people like slushy. Uh, that's good. Uh, somebody said that Callisto is the daughter of a king. Um, so uh, all the moons of Jupiter are named after uh, classical mythological figures as well. They're specifically named after all the lovers of the planet Jupiter, the god Jupiter. And if you know Jupiter or Zeus, as the Greeks called them, had a lot of lovers. So there's a lot of names um, to be uh, given to moons. Yes, and so most uh, of those moons of Jupiter are female, except Ganymede, which is the only boy. I see there are a lot of people that like um, mythology. Julia is asking if the yellow on um, um, Io is sulfur, and indeed that is correct. So you saw that uh, that surface of Io, the volcanic moon, was almost yellow, and that's, that is because there is a lot of um, sulfur in, 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 in the volcanoes, that uh, the sulfur comes out of the volcanoes as a gas and then uh, falls back on the surface and paints the surface yellow. 
-hmm. Okay, uh, there's a lot of comments. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Julia is exactly asking what I will be talking about on the next slide, so I'm not going to answer that question now. Somebody is saying um, about the creators, does it not depend, um, doesn't our moon protect uh, us from, from any impacting objects? That's not uh, actually uh, true or um, not completely at least. Um, I don't know how well the moon protects the earth from impacts, but uh, our own earth has a very young surface. Uh, most of the craters that the earth has have been erased. They have been erased by rain. They have been erased, erased by biological processes, by wind erosion. Um, if the earth wouldn't have life, if the earth wouldn't have an atmosphere, then the earth would also have a lot of craters, probably about the same number of craters as the moon. But nowadays the crater has almost, um, sorry, the earth has almost no craters and that's because they have been erased by water, atmosphere, biological processes. That's why we don't, why, why craters on the earth are so rare, why we only find those very large craters. Um, okay. Uh, is the intensity of the water jets in Europa correlated with the amount that Europa stretched? Perhaps I'll tell you in the next part that we know very little about these water plumes and it's really hard to tell exactly how that works um, with the little information that we have, but perhaps you might be right. Are there clouds on Europa? Mm, so Europa has a very thin atmosphere. There's a very thin layer of gas around it. It's so thin that you can't really see it with the naked eye. On Earth, obviously, we can see the effect of our own atmosphere if we look up, um, but on, 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 on Europa, it's so thin that it's, it's not really comparable. I don't think there are clouds there, except maybe those water jets. If they erupt, maybe you could consider that as a temporary cloud. But um, the atmosphere is really not, it's more comparable to our own moon. The moon of the Earth also has a very thin atmosphere. It's so thin, you can't see it, and there's not that much going on, at least visibly. Is it safe to go to Europa? Um, uh, that's a trick question. Um, the problem with going to Europa is that, um, and I'll tell you about that later as well, is that uh, close to your Jupiter, there is a lot of radiation. And that radiation um, uh, makes it a very dangerous environment for life. It's not a problem for anything that's in the ocean because the um, the ice protects the ocean from the radiation. But uh, if you would travel with a spacecraft to Europa, you'd have to find a way to protect the humans in that spacecraft from all the radiation. Um, so unless you have a solution for that, it would be dangerous to go there. Um, somebody said that when Theia crashed into the Earth and created the moon, a lot of craters were erased. Um, I don't know exactly when that happened, but I think that was in the very early stage of the of the solar system. So probably still a lot of craters would have formed afterwards, even uh, without that crash. Okay. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pause here and go to the next part. I see there are still questions, and I'll try to answer all of those at the end if you're uh, if you. Uh, don't mind. So last part, how can we find life? So as Yulia suggested, um, maybe we should just go to Europa with a spacecraft, land on the ice, drill through the ice and drop a submarine in the ocean and then go look for uh, hydrothermal vents or any kind of life that's uh, around. Um, I agree that would be the best scenario, but um, something like that is very technically complicated and therefore very expensive. And right now, no space agency on the Earth is willing to put down the cash to, um, to do something like that. Perhaps it will happen one day, but I think if it happens, it will be like an international collaboration just because it's so expensive and it will be far in the future, like I'm thinking 2050 here. So that's not going to happen anytime soon, even though it would be very exciting. 
for now we have to do with other ways and the easiest cheapest way for us to get a sample of Europa's ocean might be these water jets so I already told you that we have some evidence not that much but it looks like water from Europa's ocean might be coming out maybe through cracks and venting into space and in water plumes that are more than 100 kilometer high and if we could fly with a spacecraft to one of those vents of water, then we could take samples and study what's in the ocean without having to land even. And the problem is um, we don't know that much about these water plumes yet. And that's because they're very difficult to observe. We've, most of what we know about these eruptions or most of what we think we know about them it comes from this telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, until recently the best telescope we had. And it is orbiting around Earth, and Europa is just so far away from Earth that it's really hard to spot anything that's going on there. Therefore, it's kind of tricky to, de to detect these water plumes. And that's why scientists, including myself, have gone back to the data of that spacecraft Galileo. That's the only one that visited Europa from close by, and that was 20 years ago. And at the time, um, those water jets were not... Uh, not observed yet at Europa and we didn't quite know that they existed and what scientists including myself have thought is that well maybe um, in that data of that spacecraft maybe there are some pieces of evidence for these water eruptions that we didn't identify at the time because nobody was thinking about it that that could have been a water jet and um, new evidence has indeed been found in in the we have found new evidence in the measurements of that spacecraft in different ways and in my research what i have found is um a 20 year old missing case that that tells us that maybe water plumes were erupting at europa in the last part of the presentation i'm going to tell you what was missing for 20 years and why that could tell us that maybe we have another piece of evidence for the water plume but first, let me tell you a little bit more about Europa and how and about its environment. So in this picture, this cartoon in the middle, you see Jupiter and the blue lines around it are Jupiter's invisible magnetic field. If you've ever taken two magnets and tried to put them together with the wrong side, then you might, you might have noticed that these magnets were pushed apart from each other even before they touched. This is because magnets have an invisible force field. And Jupiter has a very strong magnet inside it. Earth also has an internal magnet, but the magnet of Jupiter is the strongest of all the planets. And those blue lines, they symbolize the extent of that strong magnetic field of Jupiter. Actually, the magnetic field of Jupiter is really is the largest thing in the solar system, if we could see it with the naked eye. Some of you might have seen Jupiter on the night sky. It's a bit like a bright star, like here. And if we could see that magnetic field of Jupiter, it would be larger than the moon. It would be enormous. It is really there. If you would look at Jupiter tonight, remember there's this massive magnetic field around it. It's there, but we just can't see it with the naked eye. And inside that magnetic field of, Euro of Jupiter is Europa and also Io. I told you about Io before and all the volcanoes. And Io is constantly erupting. Io is the closest one to Jupiter. And these volcanoes of Io are constantly dumping particles in, uh, in that magnetic field of Jupiter. And the magnetic field of Jupiter accelerates some of those particles to very high speeds, to 1,000, 10,000 kilometers per second, and perhaps even faster. And from the point of Europa's view, it's kind of like Europa is, is um, being bombarded in every direction by these very fast particles so when you're near europa you're seeing these fast particles come from every direction and it's these particles that were missing these particles were disappearing suddenly near europa and according to my research that might have something to do with an erupting water plume and let me tell you how that works this is a a very simple, simplified um, example of a measurement of the Galileo spacecraft. The horizontal axis tells you time, and the, um, the vertical axis tells you how many particles are measured. The blue line is the number of particles that you're measuring. 
So normally, if you're just flying around Jupiter and you're not close to Europa, you would detect about the same number of these very fast particles. But then suddenly, near Europa, the picture changes. Suddenly, when you're near Europa, you see the particles go down. Suddenly, there are less of these particles, while well, there should be a lot of them. And it goes down a little bit again, goes up again, and it goes down again. That's a little strange. It seems that close to Europa, these particles are disappearing where we would normally expect to be many. And I'm going to tell you that it has something to do with the plume, but let me, uh, I need to tell you a few more things first. So originally scientists thought, well, um, maybe it's just because of Europa. So you have to imagine that you're flying by Europa and that spacecraft is spinning around. It's constantly rotating while you're flying by Europa. And it might just be that those moments when we see like a dip, when we see all the particles disappear, uh, maybe that's just because we're looking at Europa. And it's like Europa is kind of like a sunscreen that's blocking our view. And because it's blocking our view, we don't detect the particles because they cannot go through Europa. They cannot come through it. So scientists thought, well, okay, these dips that we see close to Europa, it's just because Europa is blocking our detector and we can't see the particles. even because Europa's in the way, basically. And I investigated if that's really fully correct or not. And to do that, I have made a computer simulation in which I simulate how all these particles are moving. And that's not so simple as it sounds, because these particles, they're charged particles, they're electrically charged, they don't go through space in straight lines, instead they move in weird spirals, spirals that can bend, become bigger and smaller, it's very complicated. But if in a computer simulation you can figure out how all these particles should be moving and then compare that to what was measured and that can tell us what was causing the disappearance of the particles. And this is what I came up with. My computer simulation said oh, here there should be a dip and there there should be a dip. But if you look at the dashed line, that's what we measured, then you can see that my first simulation at least wasn't really so good. It wasn't quite fitting that well to what was actually measured. And that's because there are many things that influence how these particles are moving around Europa. For example, Europa has this thin atmosphere and that thin atmosphere kind of blocks some of these particles. That's one of the many things that we have to take into account. And I went through all these things that can uh, affect um, how these particles are moving around Europa and how many of them we really detect. And once you put everything in, I got this. It's quite close, except here in the middle, there's still something missing. There was this, this dip when we're closest to Europa, and that one can't be explained by any of the other effects. And I found that if we put a plume in the simulation, then that plume, the only thing that we hadn't looked at yet, can cause that dip. So that's pretty cool. We found by looking at these missing particles that maybe that dip here is caused by one of these plumes erupting. And that would be very interesting because that's one more piece of evidence that we have for these plumes. That's very important in the preparation of those future missions that are about to go to Europa. Cool, but not everybody agreed. This lady, um, she called me and she told me, Hans, I disagree. Uh, she's called um, Professor Margaret Kivelson. She's one of the most famous scientists in, when it comes to the moons of Jupiter. She's more than 93 years old and she's still active as a researcher. And she was part of the original team of that Galileo spacecraft. And she told me, Hans, it's nice what you found, but I think there is a mistake. She said there was a problem with the instrument. Sometimes that instrument that counts how many of those fast particles are flying around makes false dips. That's what she thought. So she said this dip that you saw and that was you think is caused by a water plume is just a bug. It's just an error in the instrument. And she might be right, unfortunately. We can't say for sure. It could be that this dip is a combination of some error and a real water plume, but from the information that we have, we can't figure it out anymore. That's a bit unfortunate. So we can't know if that dip is a water plume or if it's really only an error in the instrument. Um, why am I telling this? Uh, to show you how things really work in science. When you, you found something, you share it with the rest of the scientific community, and then somebody might find that uh, there's still something you haven't looked at. 
And it's in this way, by working together with people all over the world, that we can really move forward their understanding of Europa. But not all is lost, because I also found another uh, big dip, actually the biggest dip in the, the biggest disappearance of the biggest missing case of, of, of these fast particles. And this was during another encounter of Europa, another time when the spacecraft flew by Europa. And that dip is not affected by this bug at all. And it's the big, biggest and longest dip that we see in the data. And this dip um, also matches a water eruption. This could actually be another sign of a water eruption, and this time without errors in the instrument. So we might still have found something. And that's good news for these missions like the Europa Clipper and Juice that are going to Europa and might fly one day through one of these eruptions and take samples. And that brings me almost to the end. This is a picture from me uh, last year at the European Space Agency. It was early in the morning. You can see that I was unshaven, uh, that my jacket was wet, it was cold. And that's because I cycled really early in the morning to work to watch that container behind me arrive. What's in the container? This is inside the container. It's JUICE, our spacecraft that's going to Jupiter. It's been in the preparations for years, but it's almost there. JUICE arrived last year. Here you can see the body of the spacecraft and that thing here in the front is the antenna. It arrived at the space agency for testing. And that's already a year ago and the testing is still ongoing. If you wanna send a spacecraft into space for many years, there's nothing you can do after the launch. So you want to make sure before you launch that everything works perfectly. So that's why you test it for two years straight. The testing is still going on and it'll be launched uh, next year, but it's on the way and it looks like you'll be launching. Um, so that's very exciting times ahead for uh, scientists like us. So is there life on Europa? We don't know, but we know that there could, that there is liquid water. We know that the chemical building blocks are there. We think the ocean existed for billions of years. And we think um, that there might be a source of energy in Europa's ocean. So there could be life. And the best way to test it, or at least the only way we have available right now, is to fly through one of those water plumes. And there are two missions in preparation that might actually do that. It will take them till 2030 to get there. So we have to be patient still. But I'm already counting down, and I'm sure that after this talk, you are too. So thank you. And with that, I end the presentation, and I'm ready to take any more questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is always a pleasure to listen to your lectures. I thank just you. would like to take a look in the chat. If there are people who would like to ask questions, you have like about several minutes for this. and. Uh, after that, we will be closing. And thank you very much. It was very interesting and very engaging. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go to the questions where I stopped last time. Um, Julia was asking, why don't we, why don't we make our own jet? Why don't we make a hole in the ice of Europa so that water comes out? Um, uh, that's an interesting idea, but it's not likely to pass um, uh, because there is. A chance of life on Europa, we want to be very careful with Europa. We don't, actually, we don't want to accidentally bring any life from Earth into Europa's ocean. Because if one day we find life on Europa, we want to be sure that it's not a bacteria that we accidentally brought from Earth. We also want to protect any life that might exist in Europa's ocean from life on Earth. So that's why um, we'd rather not land on Europa. We'd rather not make any holes in the surface of Europa. We want to be as careful as we can with Europa, not to take any risk that we might contaminate it. So in theory, making a hole in the ice so that the water comes out is a good idea, but it's a bit risky because you have to bring a lot of equipment there. And so you'd have a large chance of accidentally bringing a bacteria from Earth to Europa. And that's not what we want. How much atmosphere does Europa have? Very little. Um, uh, like it's um, near the surface. It's like, a, um, it, like it's like thousands or maybe like a million times less dense than the atmosphere on the Earth. I forgot the exact numbers, but it's it's really very um, 
very very tenuous like it's um uh, uh um like a billion particles per cubic centimeter that sounds like a lot but it's really thousands and thousands of times less than how many particles there are in the ocean in the atmosphere of the earth sorry that i don't have a better number but it's really very thin that's the main thing i want to say so james webb is um somebody's asking about that is the new telescope is the best telescope we have right now it's in space and we will use that telescope to look at europa and find water plumes and because it's so good because it has such a fine resolution and because it works in infrared, it might be able to directly um, detect these water plumes much better than we were able before. So we might get some news from Europa, from, from James Webb about Europa. Uh, somebody's asking what moon is eclipsing Jupiter. Um, not sure what you were asking, referring to. So maybe you can ask your question again and explain. Uh, Somebody's asking why there's a black point on Jupiter. So I don't know which picture that was anymore, but maybe you can tell me. Uh, is this an announcement of a new paper? Um, the research that I pub I've been talking about here, my own research and the follow-up work from Margaret Kibbelson is from 2020 and 2021. So it's uh, quite recent, but not super new. Have you seen an alien? Um, not that I know, but some of you claimed in the first question that you're aliens, so perhaps. Um, so uh, the, 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 somebody's asking about what causes the, the magnetic field of Jupiter and it's likely coming from the core of Jupiter where there could be metallic hydrogen, such as uh, Derek says. Um, I'm not sure what you mean with the sine wave, and to be honest, I'm also not really an expert on how these magnets are formed inside of planets, so I'm not sure if I would be able to answer your question uh, on the level that you want, but uh, I'll try if you have more information. Is Europa tightly locked? So yes, it means that the same side of Europa is always looking at Jupiter, much like our own moon. When we look at the moon, we always see the same side pointing to the Earth. The same is true for Europa, Io, and Ganymede. Um, what if you fall in a black hole? Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave the black hole questions for later, after I finished all the Europa questions, because I'm not a black hole uh, scientist. Um, Derek is asking about spectroscopy and the plumes. So spectroscopy is a observation technique where you look very closely at the light coming from anything or the light going through something and it tells you about the chemical composition of something and that would be really interesting to do with a plume uh, for example juice and europa clipper have spectroscopy instruments if they would see a plume they could tell us a lot about what's inside the plume and maybe even about molecules that tell us something about life uh, what if we use a huge laser and provoke a jet? Yeah, it's a better idea because if you have a laser, then you wouldn't have to get close to, the, to Europa and um, you wouldn't risk uh, uh, contaminating Europa. Um, you'd still need a lot of energy and I don't know how much energy you need to, um, uh, um, to make a hole in the ice of Europa. Remember that it's a few kilometers thick, so you need a... Um, a powerful laser that can sustain a hole of several kilometers for long enough time for water to get out. I'm assuming that would be extremely complicated and very expensive, but perhaps not theoretically impossible. What if we took an X-ray of Europa to find life and water plumes? So, um, uh, um, I guess you're talking about like x-rays like in, in, in the hospital where we can use x-rays to look through a body. Um, of course, there's no x-ray scanner so large that we can put Europa in it. So I, I don't see how we would do that. But um, what's perhaps a little bit related, both Europa Clipper and Juice have um, radars on board that we can use to look through the ice. And those radars, they can send radio signals that go through the ice and then bounce back. 
and um, they could tell us like how deep is the ice and what depth is the ocean, that kind of stuff. So there are still ways that we can look a little bit through the ice of Europa, but that's not going to tell us necessarily if there's life underneath. To do that, I think we really need a sample of some fresh water of Europa. Yeah, as somebody says, oh, maybe we should use infrared light to find these hydrothermal vents. And that's tricky because you have to think the hydrothermal vents, they're at the bottom of the ocean. So above the hydrothermal vents, there's a um, 100 kilometer of water and then several kilometers of ice. So if you are above that and you use your uh, infrared camera, then you're going to see the, the, the temperature of the ice, the temperature of the water, but not from underneath. So to really see those hydrothermal vents on the bottom of Europa, it's ocean that's very tricky from outside, but you might be able to tell it from the water. If you sample the water of Europa, uh, you might be able to tell, aha, these molecules are formed by hydrothermal vents. Therefore, we know for sure that they're hydrothermal vents. That's how we might be able to tell that they're there. The new telescope that everybody's talking about, that's James Webb. And as I already told you, that one will be looking at Europa to look for plumes. Um, okay. Um, are there any more questions you want to ask? Uh, I might have missed some or not answered them very well. So just uh, write them again uh, in the chat. Uh, mm if I missed anything or if you want me to explain it better or if you have any more questions. I see that the last question somebody is asking is how do you pronounce my surname? So I'm from Belgium, from the Dutch speaking part. So it's pronounced a little bit weird. It's Herbrechts, my name. There's a weird R and a weird G in there. Um, Maximilian is asking about black holes. So I'm not an expert in black holes. I might not be the best person to answer this question. Um, what happens when you fall in a black hole? Well, one of the things that happen is the spaghetti effect. Um, so when you approach a black hole, your feet, um, let's say your feet are going down the black hole first, um, your feet will feel more gravity from the black hole than your head because gravity is stronger the closer you are. So when you're approaching a black hole, um, the, the, the gravity will pull stronger on your feet than on your head. It's the same when we stand on Earth. The gravity um, that's pulling on our feet is stronger than on our head. But on Earth, the difference between your feet and your head in terms of gravity is not that big. But in a black hole, over those one and a half or two meters, the difference in gravity will be very large. So what will happen when you approach a black hole is that you will be stretched because your feet get more gravity than your head. So you'll be stretched, and that's called the spaghetti effect. And that's one of the many uh, unpleasant things um, that happen when you approach a black hole. Um, Somebody is saying, is that me on Twitter? I think that's me indeed. Um, does a white hole exist? Um, that I don't know. I don't even know what a white hole is supposed to be. Um, but I don't think there is like an uh, established scientific theory about white holes. Um, uh, what black holes we know exist, we have evidence for them, they have pictures have been taken of black holes, or at least of the environment directly around the black hole. So those are things that we know quite well that exist. Uh, a white hole would be like an anti-gravity and the theoretical opposite of a black hole. Um, I don't I have not heard scientists, I have colleagues that work about that work on black holes and I've never heard them talk about white ho holes. So I think that white holes is not a very well established theory. Um, it's an idea that maybe some people have, but it's not something that uh, is right now based on a lot of science. So there's not much to say about them. Um, but that you in, in should general, ask that to a black hole scientist, to be sure. Thank you very much. It looks like, in general, the questions are all asked, right? I um, think so. Yep. Yeah. 
uh, just let me thank you once again on behalf of the lectures uh, about borders and arts of inquiry. They are very happy to, to launch this new initiative uh, with your lecture. It was a pleasure. <laughs>